Hello everyone, uh, my name's Janine Wright. I'm up here because I'm an employee of Isha Multicultural Women's Health Services. I'm actually the dietitian uh, that works there, uh, both with individual but particularly working uh, with groups and cultural groups around uh, improving uh, cultural food and some of the ways we talk about nutrition with different uh, cultures. So I'm going to be your facilitator uh, today. We're going to have three speakers. Uh, we've got two keynote speakers who I'm going to introduce to you and they are going to be in this first section of this morning and then we're going to have um, a 10 minute break uh, and then we're going to come back for one of our lived experience uh, speakers. So we are here in the Let's Talk Culture series and there was a very fabulous one only a few weeks ago. I was thinking I might get a show of hands. Who's come previously to the Isha Let's Talk Culture series? Hmm. And some new people along today. So probably particularly interested in the topic of parenting and mental health. So, and we're looking at that from the perspective of working with culturally and linguistically diverse communities. So, of course, before I begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that I'm doing this uh, presentation on Wajak Noongar Butcha, and I'm very much at the moment in the introduction and housekeeping section. <laughs> so, as I said, we've got two keynote speakers today talking in this broad topic area of parenting and mental health with culturally and linguistically diverse groups. Uh, the first of those will be Khadija, who will be coming up very soon and speaking here. And our second speaker, Mary, is going to be joining us uh, online. Then we'll be having our break and then we're going to have our lived experience speaker, Lou, speak to us. So a bit about Khadija, who's about to come up. So Khadija al uh, she is a qualified parenting consultant. And I'm just going to throw in right now, even though it's near the end of her bio, she is the mother of five boys. Yes, I feel this is significant and needs to be highlighted. So qualified parenting consultant, Founder of Muslima Motherhood since uh, 2015, uh, where she's working to empower Muslim women to change negative family behaviours and thrive. And when I've quickly talked to her this morning, parenting consulting, I can tell, is where her passion area is. She holds a Bachelor of Social Science in Family and Children's Studies has training in NLP, coaching, and provides mentorship in the inside-out psychological paradigm. She's a very experienced uh, facilitator, facilitator and has a lot to share with us uh, today. And uh, both her background, her parenting, all of that training and her links with her community uh, means that uh, her influence deeply resonates within her community uh, with her passion of fostering happier homes and stronger family bonds for Australian Muslim uh, children. So if you could give a warm welcome now as we welcome, welcome Khadija. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's lovely to be here. So as um, Janice has introduced me, um, I'm Khadija al -Qadur. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit about my lived experience working um, in my community um, and with women <coughs> of multicultural background, um, here, mainly in Perth, Melbourne and Sydney. So I've been doing workshops since 2015 and I have been working online and um, uh, coaching and mentoring um, women from multicultural backgrounds since 2018 and I've probably done a probably maybe 150 workshops, especially in the last two, three years, and especially since COVID. Mm. Um, so today we're talking about the cultural awareness, which is so important 
um, particularly when we talk about multicultural groups. So today's discussion is crucial for gaining a bit of insight into the challenges faced by cult culturally and linguistic diverse parents while raising their children in the prominent Australian Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Centric um, um, culture. Um, it's really important to recognise the importance of culture and how it has a huge influence because it influences every aspect of our life and particularly our parenting. Um, and sometimes we can kind of downplay um, the impact, uh, particularly in the realms of parenting. Um, it's almost like cultures like being the fish in the water. You don't really realise, a fish doesn't realise it's in the water and you don't really realise how much your culture impacts until you actually leave Australia and go overseas and then you realise how Australian you are or how culturally different you are. And I'm not talking about going to Bali. I'm talking about like when you actually go somewhere to a totally different country, right? Um, so I want to look at some of the challenges. I'm coming from the place of facilitating and working um, with um, culturally and diverse um, mothers. I've mainly worked with mothers. I have worked in, in, um, with fathers, but in general I've worked 90% of the time with mothers. And I've been consistently doing workshops at the Arab Association based in Thornley. Um, so I've done quite consistent workshops on mainly child development. And I've also done a whole heap of workshops in Melbourne in January. Um, so I was taken over there for a parenting workshop for mental health in our Muslim community. And um, yeah, just having a look at what the main obstacles that we face in parenting and mental health and service provision. For those of you who are service providers, helping you to have a bit of a more understanding of what the cultural background has an impact and faith-based um, uh, impact on parenting. So um, the, having a look at parenting providing uh, services, that, uh, sorry, having a look at the actual uh, experience that parents have in providing for their children, we know that all aspects of parenting children are formed by culture. So culture influences when and how we parent, um, how they uh, parent their children, so their cultural script, has a big impact on how that they care for their children, what parents expect of their children, what behaviours parents appreciate, emphasise and reward or dis um, discourage and punish. In general, in my experience, we've got people who've come as migrants who are here as professionals and working in the, in the sector, or they've come here for better education or to work in... Um, um, you know, engineers, doctors, etc. And then you have people who've come from trauma backgrounds. So they're, they're a refugee or they've come from a background where um, living in Australia provided a better experience for them. Um, so th when you look at these two groups, there's still similarities in how they raise their children, but there's definitely a difference in in regards to their children, there's definitely a difference in the ones that have experienced some kind of trauma background, war, things like that. Um, how much they are actually more pro proactive to actually learn more about um, parenting and be able to, um, uh, I suppose, uh, build the resilience in their children because of their past experience. Um, so understanding how culture shapes parenting is paramount, especially if it influences the prevailing cultural script in child rearing. So thus cultural norms become manifest in the mental health of children through parenting. This is huge. Um, I get, when I do workshops, I get um, average 30 women will attend workshops and will attend their whole six weeks. Now, I don't have a comparative to say in normal mainstream services, but what I have learnt is in general, you don't obtain that amount of women who stay and actually go through. And I'll give you some reasons why that is later on when we look at why um, uh, positive parenting strategies that really help. But I do think this is important to understand some of the challenges that they face when they are come to this country. So in general, there's probably three factors that affect um, um, parenting. A lot of them are faith-based, so they're quite strong in their Catholic or their um, Muslim. I do have non-Muslims that come to my workshops. Um, I have even non-Muslim counsellors that come just to learn how I facilitate when I'm um, teaching um, women from multicultural backgrounds around their parenting styles, making them help understand attachment, understand child development, understand basically the child psychology and the development of their children because that helps them to show up different with their kids once they have that knowledge and they have those strategies. So there's that aspect. There's the aspect of um, 
This is the prevailing Australian culture, which is foreign to them and they don't know. And a big, a really important thing to understand is the emotional challenge of someone that's coming from a different country for whatever reasons and coming and residing in Australia or even second generation Australian, as in children that are born here, is that feeling that we're still from somewhere else rather than from here is a big one. And when I say this to you, I'm not just talking about um, I'm not just talking to you about migrants. I'm talking to you about Australian women who have, you know, a fifth generation, sixth generation, seventh generation Australian, and then have converted into Islam and taken on an Islamic or faith-based identity. They start to feel like I'm not from here. So that's another aspect that's not even thought about or talked about. And it was a big part when I did my university degree um, in family support programs. This is one area I actually looked in deep and I realised there was no support for those particular women. Um, my mother was one of them. My mother was a Catholic, Irish, converted to Islam in the late 70s. And it's really interesting because when you probably see me first and foremost, the first thing that you pick up is my headscarf. That's culturally normal. And when you see my headscarf, you're going to have certain ideas and messages about what I am and who I am based on my headscarf. You're not going to see that I'm seventh generation Australian Irish. You're not going to see that. So this is what we talk about with cultural biases. We believe we see people in a certain way, but we don't actually know them. And this is where we want to break down those barriers and actually get to know people and actually realize who is this person actually. Um, so this is important because as a seventh generation Australian, I've never actually felt like I belong. And this is very, very important going through, especially after September 11, going, I remember the first day going back to TAFE um, and I just looked like the enemy and I was like 17 years old. I was like, okay, things are switched here. As a person that went to public school, went to, was the public speaker in my Linwood Senior High School, as someone who my grandmother, my Irish grandmother, emphasised like no, no tomorrow that, you know, this is who your heritage is. And I come from a, a cultural, um, if I look at my Australian culture, I come from a history of people that were principals and teachers. My, gra my grandfather, Robert Ingram, was a principal for a boys' school. My grandmother, Janet Ingram, was a, um, a principal for a girls' school and she became a teacher in Canada. She went off to teach deaf students. So I come from a history of teachers. I come from teaching was extremely something that was mentored and passed on to us. And my grandmother had this big worry when I was a child. You know, here I was, my father's Lebanese. I've come in, it's the Gulf War, it's the late 80s. My grandmother had this really worry that, oh my God, my grandchildren are not going to be, they're going to be rejected, they're not going to be seen as Australian. And it did have a big impact that my grandmother came in and she was able to kind of advocate and remind us, don't you ever forget that you are very Australian. And, and see, this is the thing, when you come from a multicultural background, you don't see, there's a lot of, there's a big likelihood of unconscious incompetency. Unconscious incompetency means, for example, me as a Muslim woman, when a non-Muslim or any male comes to me and greets me, if they have unconscious um, incompetency, they are not going to try and shake my hand when I don't touch men. They're not going to know this. And so when you grow up in a culture and you're aware of your Australian culture and you're aware of your background as in different, um, whatever that background is, and then you are then operating in the dominant Australian society, that can create a identity crisis and create the, the feelings that you need to explore growing up that a lot of the ideas that you're taught, for example, as an Australian, you're very much taught to have autonomy and independence in your decision making and be an individual and shine your light. But then for those that come, one of the biggest challenges posed for child parents is that navigating their children's upbringing in the Australian context is that most of the time they come from a collectiveless traditional background. So sharing and interpersonal skills, inter interdependence is so important in the traditional state. For example, you go have breakfast in the family of a Malaysian family. We have breakfast in an Egyptian family. You have breakfast in a Pakistani family. You go watch them dynamics of breakfast, very different to an Aussie family. So the biggest difference when they come and eat food, we all prepare together and we all eat together and it's a very shared response. But when you grow up in, a, in an Australian family, a lot of the time it's kind of like, you know, Tom, 
do you want your two toast? Like, how would you like that? So everyone's very individual and gets to choose and be kind of um, catered for, but in a very collective, um, collectiveless family upbringing, it's a very different. So the cultural interplay, the interconnect of parent and child and decision making is very, very different, which is very challenging for parents of um, clad backgrounds because they have very strong notions of how their children should think and feel. And then these children then grow up and go to Australian public schools and that, and their notion is, wait a minute, I'm meant to be an individual, I'm meant to have separation from my family, I'm meant to show up a certain way. So there's clashes there because the parent can a lot of time find this as disrespectful. They can find like, there's kind of like a blind obedience that you're meant to obey me and how dare you try to, uh, think differently. And this comes up as a big factor for parents. They have a lot of distress, especially when the child hits a teenager and then he or she wants to dress differently or he or she wants to do things that are differently to their traditional norm, that they can feel very lost and they can feel very distant to their child and take their child's behavior really personally. So being an understanding when a child's actions identity don't align with their cultural expectations is probably one of the biggest challenges for parents of this background. Another persuasive concern which comes across very often, especially in Asian communities, is what will people think? This is a very big concern for, their, for these parents. Well, the children are less so worried about this. So this fear can actually trigger social exclusion, especially amongst teenagers with clad backgrounds. Many of them will experience intolerance or judgments amongst um, their faith-based heritage. So if they do things that are not appropriate to their cultural faith, they can be excluded or the parents start to exclude them or their parents be like, oh no, what will people think about us? So they will a lot of time restore to secretive behaviors. They, will, they won't be able to have that dialogue. There can be a blockage, which is really interesting because when you look at collectivist um, communities in den general, while Australia were, and very traditional um, ethnic backgrounds, indirect communication is really important. Indirect communication is different like me. I jump on and I write an email. This is kind of my, the, the Australian part of me would just be like, I'm very focus oriented and I just want to write the email and say, okay, Khadija, you've got to add the dear, how are you? Just add, soften this a little bit, right? But in, when you come from a background where there's this, especially an ethnic background where this interconnectedness is there, the indirect communication really wants that connection. They want to feel that connection. They want to feel like they belong. And I do think this is one of the biggest challenges is that feeling, oh, do I really belong? Do I really belong to, um, and I think that's one of the biggest reasons why I focused in my work was to go solely working with Muslim women because there was this general, this is probably my own intergenerational trauma, was this feeling like, well, I don't really belong with the professionals that I normally would work with that have an Anglo-Saxon or Anglo-Centric background. So I'm just gonna work with the, my, the people I know, my people. So it's very interesting when you show up in that, in that, in that place that you realize your own um, experience as a child and your own cultural script has been impacted. Watching my Lebanese father, the racism that he experienced throughout my whole life from as a child, really taught me to take a step back and really empower the Muslim Australians that I know, that I work with, the parents that I work with, and support them to stand up and have very clear views about that you belong and that you have every right to share um, your experiences. Um, when I talk about the secretive behaviour, so recently I had a... Um, I had a mother that came to me. She is Malaysian Singaporean. Father is Australian revert, so he's Australian reverted to Islam or converted to Islam. Um, he's a Catholic background, Australian Bosnian, and they had a 16 year old daughter who had a boyfriend. So, based on faith based and cultural understanding values and based on uh, culture in general, complete no no, not allowed. And so how they dealt with the situation was they got the 16-year-old girl and biggest worrying about what will the community think and, you know, she's going to be stigmatised, she won't be, get, be able to get married later on. Um, they would make her see him in the garden at home instead of meeting at the movies or somewhere else. They were so worried what will people think. And this had a big strain on their relationship, but this is how they were able to manage it. So understanding parents' concern. There is a lot of concern by parents of what will people think. Um, so, uh, the process of acculturation where individuals of clad background adapt to the culture of the new environment, 
that can cause intergenerational tension between children and their parents. So the conflicts between parents and the children can result in young people distancing themselves from traditional values and embracing the norm of their local cult of their of the host country. So lack of open communication and control and demanding respect, even when it's not given to the child, is, is quite a norm. Um, struggles, concerns and feelings aren't spoken about, which can cause a lot of resist, resentment and distancing. So parents will come in, mothers will come in, and there's so much concern and worry and resentment. And like my child, my teenager is now becoming this different person. And mothers, re it's a very interesting phenomenon, especially in Asian, Asian communities, mothers expressing their need to control over their child's decision making, including like career choices, marriage even. They're very like, you, you know, I have to, I want you, I demand you to go this way. And so that can cause a lot of conflict. Um, so children often face intense pressure, stress, and even shame to pursue non-traditional career paths and excel academically. There's a lot of pressure. I was just um, counselling two 14-year-olds in the last month, completely different um, families, and both of them were just crippling anxiety because of their father's pressure of them having a good education and um, doing really well academically. And they were so stressed out and they were creating a belief, even though one of them was constantly getting high marks, they were creating the belief that they weren't good enough, that they were bad. And so they, what would, would attribute some criticism and harshness in the parenting of the parent. But I think it was coming from a good place because the parent wanted their child to mm. do really well academically. Mm. But the child's mental health was being impacted by this harsh expectation by the parent's kind of own fear-based parenting of, no, oh, my God, my child has to excel. We've come to this child. Uh, we've come to this country. My child has to, um, has to um, do better and be better. Um, parents' concern in using mainstream services, obviously I work um, and I did uh, originally uh, when they originally had Parenting WA in Langford back in 2014, 2015, before they closed down a whole lot of services, I would uh, work with multicultural women, mothers then do some workshops. Um, they were more likely to attend a workshop where they felt like they had some connection with the facilitator. So there's definitely some distrust in mainstream services. Uh, there's a big worry when the children have um, mental health issues, especially as teenagers, to not access services because they're worried that their children will be removed from them or they're worried that the information will be seeped, uh, seeped out to the community. And so this, there is a fear there. Um, some of the figures I've put up there um, is um, from a report where they studied six multicultural communities in New South Wales. And what they did find... Um, is that there were, there were higher rates. I can personally say, because I've worked in some of the Muslim schools, I would say there is a high rate of anxiety amongst um, teenage boys and girls. And uh, there's a number of reasons for that. But I do think there is, in general, um, the service provision of mental health services is not seeping enough into communities. They're not helping the people that really need it at the grassroots. Um, not long ago, I went to visit um, the mental health hospital in Armadale, and it was full of um, young men from Somali background. Mm -hmm. So it was really eye-opening to me. I could see the mothers were struggling with their with their sons, and you know, it just really shows that there's a gap. There's a gap there that's not being supported. There's a gap there in this area, and it really leaves them in isolation because because it's so taboo subject, even more so than our mainstream. I mean, we've improved so much on the mainstream, I think, but it's such a taboo subject still that if your child has a mental health issue or going through mental well-being, that there is this, still this stigma about accessing services. If anything, it's attributed to some religious deficiency, which is a mis... which is a... a, a um, what do you call it? A um, wrong perception. Mm. So in self-evaluation, because I've done a lot of workshops and hundreds of workshops in, in Melbourne, Perth, um, especially in the last two years, um, I do self-evaluations with my mothers and three most overwhelmed, three, sorry, three most primary emotional states that kept coming up over and over again is overwhelm, loneliness and anger. So these three emotions will often um, coincide with a very much a self-perception from mothers from multicultural backgrounds that they are to blame. That instead of understanding the children's behaviour as just children's behaviour, 
personalising it and kind of self-blaming and, and thinking they've failed, um, especially when the child had um, not acquired the home language or had lost it over time. Mm -hmm. um, if the child was playing up or not doing very well academically, there was very much an attributing that it must be something wrong with them or that they have a lack of ability or self-belief. And this is important for them. This was an important area because this insecurities later in, in when they learnt about child development, they understood child psychology, they understood attachment, they understood um, what is age appropriate for children, they felt so much better because they then less. So there's definitely this aspect of straight away to self-blame. So, uh, And I think this is really important because when you are accessing someone who is or coming to your services or if they are wanting to um, learn more, a lot of, they're in a very vulnerable state. So a lot more um, compassion, understanding on the first entry of meeting them, I think is really, really important because there's a lot happening for them. And um, a lot of it's li linked to social support services not being received in terms of guidance of child development rearing because they're, 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 they're stuck in their own cultural childhood script. Mm. Um, another thing that's, like, that's mentioned over and over again is where is the village? <clears throat> Where is the village? Where is mothering the mother? You've got to understand a lot of people who have multicultural backgrounds, example, when they go through pregnancy, they go through birth, they literally have to call up a family member back home to bring them over to support them because they're used to a very interconnected support and connection after birth. Um, and they're not used to just kind of do it your own, back to it, you know. Um, so... This is very normal. This is like, yeah, my mum's coming from India, my mum's coming from Pakistan, my mum's coming from Malaysia to help support me. So there is this perception that where is the support? I need the support. Um, so this comes up a lot um, for women and mothers in that situation. Also, I, I mean, obviously I can't do a comparison to what the figures are in our, uh, based on Australian, is um, a father's withdrawal. So a lot of time in co-parenting relationships can come a lot of conflict. And there is um, the bulk of the uh, child, uh, parenting is, is on the children. Um, my Uruga mothers, so the ones who've come from refugee backgrounds, um, I found they were so thirsty to learn more. They knew about the intergenerational traumas. They knew about the trauma. For those of you who don't know much about the Uruguay Chinese, um, they have been prosecuted in um, China and many of them have been relocated to Melbourne and Perth particularly, and they were the most eager to want to learn more. They understood their traumas. They understood they had, you know, family displacement. They, they knew that family members had disappeared. Um, they had, so they really were um, eager to heal their own wounding to be able to um, be more resilient for their children. And so when seeking support, these were often the, the barriers to seeking support. Um, so some of them was a lack of childcare support. Mm -hmm. Many of them don't have extended family to support. Um, another one was, was compelling demands and inconvenient schedules. So evening sessions are not going to work. Mm -hmm. You want to be doing things in the day. You want to be doing them in, in the time. Logistical hurdles, so challenging related to distance, transportation, access. Fear mm -hmm. of judgment is huge. I don't think we realise how judgmental we can be to someone of a different cultural background. Um, so there was this judgment. I asked this question to a few girlfriends on Friday night. I went out with them. One's a teacher. One's a. We're all born. We're all born and brought up here. We, you know, all have professional backgrounds. One's a teacher. One operates a gym. Another one is a physiotherapist. We've all got different backgrounds. And I asked them, "Hey, girls, do you still get experiences where you get talked to like you can't speak English?" And God, we spoke for 45 minutes of all the experiences mm. of where we're still spoken to like we can't speak English. So um, it's really interesting. And this is what I mean by that, that judgment. We've all had one experience I want to share with you, which is really interesting. A few years ago, I went to, had to have, um, um, I went to go to some, a specialist. I went to see a specialist doctor. I walked in the Netherlands, walked in, stood there. She's like, oh, we're just waiting for the interpreter. I said, oh, the interpreter. I said, what, what, what is, what's the interpretation for? She's looked at me and she's heard my voice, right? And I'd love to know what I'm being interpreted for. And she said, oh, Iraqi. And I was like, oh, so how, how, did, how did my name Khadija Alcador become Iraqi? And she just looked godsmacked. And she's like, oh, she calls up. She goes, she just didn't know what to say. They just assumed. They looked at my name, decided I needed to be interpreted to Iraqi language. Mm -hmm. So it's probably, you would not believe how much this is, uh, uh, this is um, affects us as parents from multicultural backgrounds. <laughs> Last week at Coles, 
You know when you go to Coles and sometimes you pick up the, the items that's like a bit reduced, you know, the yellow sticker? Mm -hmm. So standing in the Coles line, she takes the thing. This is yellow sticker. Half price. I said, thanks for letting me know that. I've known it since I was a kid. So, and then God smacked us like, oh gosh, she speaks English. We have to experience that. Mm. We have to experience that so often, it's not funny. Because when you people look at me, you only see my headscarf and you only see a certain image of what you think of me. But we're actually most, most multicultural mothers or multicultural people that come from cloud backgrounds are actually very educated. They're usually the ones that had to prove themselves. They had to step up and say, hey, I've got, I, I came too. So don't underestimate or assume that she does, she speaks a different, she's not unable to comprehend or speak English. So another challenge is the need to support adult faith-based clad mothers in shifting their negative childhood association, disappearing beliefs concerning God, their identity as Australian, and how they approach parenting in this context. Unfortunately, in a lot of clad, clad backgrounds where there has some, and this is not just in any particular regions, but in general, there is some fear-based religion and kind of a glorifying of blind obedience. Mm. It's not kind of the Aussie way that we do kind of like, let me question this and have a say about this and speak my truth. That's not as encouraged. So that can be an issue of being able to navigate that. And that can be passed on from generation to generation where it's almost like, well, God would not be happy with you doing that. So it's being able to help them to have that uh, understanding of that. Another crucial factor in reluctance to seek out mental health services and counselling in parent support um, until the mental health conditions reach a severe level. I did mention the African um, community. So there is that cultural taboo, as I mentioned, around um, mental health services. Um, I gave the example here where a mother told me how she walked out of a, the service that she went to get some um, crisis and mental health care for her teenager because um, they were all white and they spoke to her like she couldn't speak English. The example I just gave. So let's have a quick look at some of the uh, understanding negative assumptions and in interference in the Australian woman's family, often strains relationships. So this is an Australian that marries a multicultural or linguist um, clad background husband. And so the children are born um, basically like my situation where they're born with two different identities, two different cultural scripts, um, two different understandings uh, that reflects both of them. But the great thing about that is those children usually have a high level of emotional intelligence <laughs> and they usually have a high level of um, bicultural awareness. And what is emotion, uh, cultural intelligence? Cultural intelligence is a set of capabilities that are proven to predict success in situations characterized by culturally diversity, proven to predict success. When you're more culturally diverse, you understand things. My children have eight nationalities, mm. eight nationalities. My first husband was a Malaysian uh, Welsh and my beautiful husband who's sitting at the back supporting me is Pakistani. Mm -hmm. So I understand cultural background. Mm. So my children have, they're Welsh, <laughs> Irish, Lebanese, Australian, Chinese, Malay, Maori, what was the, have I done all eight? What's the last one? Pakistan. <laughs> Australian. <laughs> the eighth generation Australian. It's really interesting. I asked my 19-year-old, I said, what do you tell people? Because I just tell them I'm Lebanese. I said, how come you never tell them you're Australian? He goes, I don't know, mum. <laughs> and, like, and I asked my 23-year-old, I asked him the same question to me because they work in the mines. I said, what do you tell people? Do you, I, I was in, so interested because I just tell them I'm Malay. What? And I'm like, you guys never actually told people you're eighth generation Australian. It's like, no. So just notice the disconnect mm. because I don't feel like they're part of it. Mm. And this is really important in parenting when you've been trying to encourage your children to, uh, to identify. So finishing off. Discipline is a big issue. <laughs> discipline is a real one. <laughs> it's seen by women. Um, a lot of the time, discipline is seen as a form of punishment. It's not seen as a teachable moment. So discipline a lot of the time. But it's a really important, and having a child protection background, is to be aware mm. that culture can sometimes mistake in what is seen as maltreatment as actually quite norms in that culture. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful and have a sensitivity towards that. Because what we can come in, it can cause more damage in some situation. I'm not condoning abuse. I'm just saying that we have to be very careful how we go into situations of people that have different perceptions of what discipline is. Mm -hmm. Okay. A sense of belonging and identity crisis. I did look at uh, looking a little bit at that. And I'm going to finish off by mentioning... Oh, so some one big thing. I'm going to actually go to straight to effective parenting approaches that have actually helped. So the key findings I found that have helped in parenting with their children's mental health, these are key aspects that have been very helpful, is the motherhood and parenting circles. 
They love that interconnection. They love not feeling judged. They love that they can come in a group of women are completely all multicultural just because the Arab Association, we have women from Asian women, we have, you know, Somali women, we have um, women from Middle Eastern backgrounds, and they can all come together and they can share. When they start to learn about child development more and child psychology, it helps them so much. Mm -hmm. So this is really important because one of the resilient, safe, mental health protective factors is children are exposed to some level of racism, so they need to feel um, that they have some sense, a sense of belonging. Um, that cultural understanding, facilitators that have cultural awareness, cultural understanding is mm -hmm. so important. You, you, like I said, it feels like being fish in the water. It almost feels like, um, you know, we feel like we know, but we actually don't know. There's so much more depth to it, um, and that causes that rapport. Strength-based approach, it's so always going to strength-based parenting. So family-centered, strength-based, really, really, really important to not overemphasize aspects of that faith base and exaggerate it and kind of only see the people from that lens. That's really, really important um, in the mother's competency in parenting and mental health. So really supporting her. Intergenerational impact is really important. It's helping them to recognize that there's inter intergenerational impacts on the parenting and that they get to choose to do differently to their family of origin that they can choose to, to raise their children differently while within the Australian context and encourage that Australian identity in their children. Um, Self-regulation is a big one. So emotional regulation, uh, most were not brought up with co-regulation, so learning to self-regulate, so emotional intelligence, learning about their emotions, learning to validate their experience, their, emo their human mm. experience emotionally is really, really helpful for them and inclusive environments. So creating that environment that promotes indirect communication, warmth and inclusion is essential. Breaking dysfunctional family patterns, community small support and faith-based communities. You'll find a lot of CAD backgrounds, they'll come have fates together, they'll have play groups together. They do things together to keep that community spirit and uh, respectful communication. So when you're exaggerating cultural or faith backgrounds as a source of the problem, you're gonna, they're gonna disconnect. So seeing not people as a source, as a problem, or seeing your culture as more dominant or better. So there's a lot of stereotyping around that. And respecting cultural scripts, which is basically don't minimise their gender, culture, faith, or ethnicity, or as being a person of colour, but really understanding, building that rapport. You build that rapport, they will keep coming back to services and, and, and mm. be connected to you. Okay, thank you very much. I know I went, um, forgive me for going a bit over time, <laughs> and I will pass on to the next person. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Khadija. Um, as I mentioned at the end, we're going to have Khadija and Lul and Mary will be uh, online and so an opportunity to ask some questions there. One of the great things about working in the CALD space is that our story is emphasised. And um, although we've got this category of keynote speakers and lived experience, I'm sure you picked up uh, that the passion and probably some of the connection points that you have around uh, Khadija's insights actually come from lived experience of doing all of those workshops. And I've got some questions about those coming up. So Mary is already there and it looks like Mary knows the recording has started, everyone. So who we have here is Mary Gagoyne um, and Mary's positions have a lot of C's in them. Let me tell you. Mary is the Chair of the Association for Culturally Appropriate Services and Director of the Centre for Capability and Culture. <laughs> Uh, she has a wealth of experience working uh, with organisations at all different uh, levels, uh, government, private, community and national state uh, levels and she serves as a multicultural ambassador to the Mental Health Foundation of Australia, uh, leading research on isolation factors uh, in issues faced by migrants. So Mary's um, personal journey as a migrant herself and raising bilingual uh, children uh, also uh, will inform uh, her insights and um, perhaps you'd like to reflect on some things that maybe haven't gone to plan for you today. Mary's joining us um, because she's very respectfully um, adhering to some COVID um, isolation and so presenting uh, with us uh, online. 
There we go. Okay. Well, look, I, I, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to speak. It's one of the magic of technology that uh, things that such as COVID that try and uh, derail you, you can get around them through being respectful of your health and well-being by speaking online. Um, so, yes, thank you for including me uh, in, in this very, very interesting um, morning. Um, I think the, the, the attitude I've taken is that culturally and linguistically diverse families can best share their thoughts and their experiences and through those thoughts and through, through their own experiences, while they are unique, we can also learn lots of things. So it's really uh, that is the approach I've taken is to share some stories and through those stories, get the power of learning that comes from those stories. So the first story is, uh, I think it's important to start on your own story because it's quite easy, isn't it, to point the bone at other people if you don't start by understanding that your own perspective actually has uh, a big impact on how you see the world. So my own story is very much uh, understanding what it's like to be excluded. Like I migrated to Australia as a post-war uh, with, with my family as a post-war, although my father had been here four years before we arrived. So you can see the photo of the, of the people who were my family who left Italy all that time ago, my mother and the three of us. Um, we were, our arrival to Australia, it was really quite a rude shock because we came from a little town with, uh, you know, everybody being very much one happy family, sharing everything, very open sort of warm um, uh, environment, to uh, coming to Australia where I was heavily restricted from all activities outside of the school day. I was excluded from popular fun activities and parties because they were all risks. They were, you know, the, the way of life here was seen as, um, an, you know, unknown and a possible area of uh, danger for, for a young girl. Uh, and this was a stark contrast with my brother's relative freedom. Uh, I was even restricted in things like, you know, I like, like my brothers. I performed well at school and loved learning. But um, even where there were scholarships that required me to leave home uh, for a period, whether that be a day or two or, or a week, like in the case of scholarships where I was one of the top 10 students in maths in the state and I was given a scholarship to go and um, have a live-in um, workshop with at UWA for a week or two, I can't remember the length. Well, that clearly was unacceptable and I just couldn't accept the scholarship. Uh, any inter-school activities that required nighttime activity was regarded as unacceptable. Um, so uh, having said that, it was a very happy family. So I did actually uh, learn a lot from my own experiences in um, being, a, being a migrant. First of all, I learned that gender stereotypes are not fair. They were clearly a, a, a bone of contention for me all through my life um, in the family, in, in my first family. Um, that the other thing I learned is that though it's a bone of contention and real and angers you, you have to somehow find allies in your family and in the community to help fight your fight. Otherwise, you're not going to uh, make changes. And I learned that exclusion from mainstream does actually have a heavy burden that it places on you, uh, both on a personal level, like uh, friendships and so on, as well as in your career goals. And, and so what I guess that uh, taught me is a huge determination to do better personally, uh, both uh, uh, myself personally, as well as a parent to a son and daughter. So I tried really hard as a parent to navigate the pride in cultural identity by uh, um, make, uh, in, in a sense, encouraging my kids to uh, be bilingual. Uh, I had my mother living in, the, in our home for a number of years, so um, I, I used that as the excuse that we must speak uh, in Italian so that she could understand. 
And uh, then we went to Italy for a while where my children with surprise said, wow, it's not only old people who speak Italian. That's amazing. <laughs> you know? So um, it was quite interesting. And though I tried uh, very hard to navigate the pride in their cultural identity and the, to support them in their, in their own choices, it was quite interesting that as adults, they turned around and said to me, yes, well, you did say we could make whatever choices we wanted, but there was no doubt in our minds that you wanted us to be professionals. That was just understood. You know? And so uh, that's quite interesting how we have that, um, you know, that, that, that whole thing around what we think we're, the messages we're giving and the messages we're actually giving. And I share that because I think if we do learn from our own experience before I go to some other case studies that I think show a lot about culturally and linguistically diverse families. Um, the first one, all of these cases come out of uh, things that are in the public domain. This one here comes from a book called Psychotherapy Tales. You may, uh, some of you may know my husband, Aldo Gagoni, who's uh, obviously a family therapist uh, and uh, has uh, is, if, if you like, one of the leading lights of family therapy in the state. So uh, in this book, he, he has a collection of some of his stories. And this one, I think, is very relevant. So the, 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 this particular case was about a, a, a father who migrated as an adult, who met his wife, who was of the same background, but had was born in Australia. And they had three teenage daughters. And uh, when he came, the three teenage daughters were aged 17, 15 and 13. The girls were heavily restricted from out of school activities. The eldest was a 17 year old who had attempted suicide after sneaking out. So that's why she was referred to uh, family therapy. And they uh, agreed to go because uh, they had they learned that this family therapist was of their same cultural background. So they, there was a level of trust there. But what was really interesting was um, the story behind what led to uh, the young girl suicide uh, or attempting suicide was that um, she wasn't allowed to go to anything. There was This was uh, an end of... Uh, you know, high school party of some sort that she felt was really important and she asked for to be able to go out. The, there was no way that the father would allow that. So the mother tried to say, look, you know, you can't go this time, but, you know, maybe when you go to university, maybe where things can change, if you can show you're trustworthy and all of this. So uh, one of the unusual things that happened on this particular occasion, whereas she normally fought tooth and nail with the parents, this particular evening, she didn't. She just uh, straight after dinner said she was tired and went to, to her room. And uh, when the mother a little later checked, she could see that uh, the, the lights were out and the, and the daughter was asleep. So she came back. Then uh, when she went again, she was a little suspicious because there hadn't been any moving in the bed. So she went to see and, of course, it was pillows and things that had been put there uh, in the shape of a body. And um, she, the, the mother debated, should she tell her, father, her, her husband or should she not? And, of course, um, she knew that if she didn't tell him that there would be even a worse reaction in due course in the morning. So she felt she should tell him but get his agreement to not do anything till the morning after. And so this is uh, the situation. He did he did promise to do that, but of course, on the actual evening, he um, actually sat in her room until she came, and then put the light on, and um, all hell broke loose around that matter. And then he she ran to the bathroom and locked the door, and of course. Um, uh, there were many pills in the bathroom and uh, the father and mother were, you know, trying to get in. Finally, they had to break in, of course, and um, she had uh, taken an overdose and was rushed to hospital where um, they uh, said to, to, to the family that they needed to go for family therapy. They needed to uh, not uh, hit the children and all of that sort of thing. So the first thing the uh, father said on walking into the therapy session was, don't tell me that I can't hit my children or I'll leave, you know. Um, so he uh, basically the therapist said, well, OK, uh, tell us a little bit about you and where you come from and 
what what your upbringing was he said well I learned about discipline in my childhood everything you know what my parents said went and that's the way it was so he said well could you give us a specific example of something that you remember of your childhood that actually showed what that was about and what was your relationship with your father and mother and so on so he said well one that was really um stood out in my in my experience was when I must have been a child of about 12 or 13 and on my way to school I uh, my friend and I um we saw these uh, beautiful peach trees and uh, there were a couple of really ripe peaches so we looked around couldn't see anyone so we uh jumped over the fence and took a couple of peaches each jumped back and off we went so uh, that evening uh when um I got home my father looked at me and said, have you got anything to tell me? And um, he said, no, why? He said, look, could you just come down to the, um, uh, you know, to the cantina you know, where, where we have our wine, et cetera, with me to give me a hand? So he came. He went downstairs and just noticed there was something really odd uh, about the situation because there was a rope that was hanging from the roof. Uh, and there was also a bucket of water with a rope in it. So he was a little surprised and wondering what was going on. And then his the father said, right, undress, please. And he said, why? He said, you need to undress now. And he knew by the tone of his father's voice that it was time to undress. So he did, uh, not knowing what was going on. And he said to him, can you tell me, is there something you need to tell me about today? And he said, no, why? And he said, okay, lie down. And he tied up his feet with the rope and uh, pulled it up so that he was to hang, hang, uh, hanging upside down. And he said, did you have anything you needed to tell me about today? And um, the father, the, the, the child said, why? I, I, I've got nothing to say. And so the father took the, um, the wet rope out of the bucket and hit him and said, have you got anything to tell me about today? And kept doing so until the child screamed and he was allowed to come. He said, yes, yes, okay, yes, we stole. My, my friend and I, we stole a couple of, of uh, peaches each. And the, the father said to him, um, look, put, pulled him down and said, look, don't you ever lie to me again. He said, when you've got something to tell me, you need to do it and you need to be honest. I hope you've learned something from this. At this stage, while he was telling this story, his the, the wife and daughters all had tears in their eyes, feeling really, really, really sad about such a terrible thing happening to their father and husband. And uh, so the uh, therapist said to him, and what did you learn from that experience? You know, did you feel really uh, loved at, at that moment? He looked shocked. He said, loved? I was peeing and, and pooing myself. I was so frightened I didn't, I couldn't speak hardly. He said, and um, is that what you would want your children to feel about you? And there was silence at that point. And it was after that silence that the family um, said that he, he could see there was a shift in the father's thinking and that whole moment of family empathy suddenly there was an opening in the door and there was a shared desire to change so the focus no longer became whether there was a stick or there was not a stick to be had for for the children's upbringing but more how to change so that things became better and that was i suppose a story that we have some learning from of course First of all, then having a cultural understanding of the therapist so that there is no assumption that this man is a hateful man because he, he believes in the stick. You know, to avoid this, uh, uh, the stick and go on a voyage of discovery together. So rather than talk about the stick as though that was the important thing, to actually shift the, the, the agenda and go on a voyage of discovery about where we want to go, not what we need to not let go of. Uh, and getting those family bonds so it's something that's done together. And everyone was stimulated to self-reflect 
and make change together. So I thought that was a really interesting story about change and how you can make that happen in the family situation. And, and they did go, of course, on to various family therapy sessions to create a change over time. Um, this other case comes through, uh, again, a, 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 a well-known author, Lao, uh, who wrote a lot of things around transcultural issues in family therapy. And this particular one struck me as something really interesting because of the focus that we um, talked about as a focus on, on single mums. This uh, story is about Mrs B, who was an orphan um, at eight, and she was brought up by her extended family. She married at 13. And uh, by the time she was 25, she was deserted by her husband and she moved to England when Aftab was about eight. Aftab was seen to be, you know, a perfect pre-adolescent, but some, something happened in adolescence and he started uh, <clears throat> practicing theft, glue sniffing, became suicidal, he was into car theft, all the, all the bad things possible. Uh, there were, he was the youngest of, of uh, other kids, as you can see, of, uh, and, and at the time they presented, um, the two older uh, girls were both married and with little children. Uh, and uh, the therapist uh, observed the behaviour of the mother and uh, the uh, daughters towards the little six-month-old, the fact that um, there was lots of loving, soft relationship with the the, um, the little six-month-old, but there was absolutely no contact uh, with Aftab at all. And uh, she also noticed that um, with the uh, six-month-old child, when uh, the grandmother would pick up the child, as soon as the child started showing signs of being unhappy, she'd immediately leave them alone and uh, get him back to her daughter. Um, so it was a really interesting situation when, when, when she was in therapy. When, uh, when she went to England, um, she first of all, um, uh, uh, you know, lived near her sisters, but then she moved to London uh, near the father's side of the family where all the men appeared to be damaged, like uh, they were uh, like, like her, her ex-husband, alcoholic, violent gamblers. Um, and really, the uh, Mrs. B had no support except through her older daughters. So um, what uh, it, during therapy sessions became obvious was that men were demonised in the family, both Mrs. Z, B and her daughters, um, were really, uh, as soon as Aftab was starting to become a young man, their attitude towards him changed and there was no soft physical um, uh, link with Aftab. And uh, so they then started, uh, the, with the therapist, they explored what was the expectation of men, um, a good man rather than a bad person and gradually looked at seeing how Aftab could be given much more the role of a good Muslim son who could look after his mother, so that that became part of the conversation around how to make those changes happen. Um, and I think, again, uh, what is evident in that particular session with uh, Lao, uh, or in a number of sessions, really, that Lao had with that family, was that she had cross-cultural skills as a therapist, that she used the culture and religion to positively reframe TAB. And she used observation of family behavior towards the young boy, the six month old, to consider possible change strategies. Um, and she also um, understood that the life of a migrant single mum without family support is fairly complicated, keeping in mind what a young mother she was and uh, also looking at how the family strengths could actually um, build change. Um, where was I? Oh, sorry, I, I seem to have gone wrongly here. Apologies. 
Okay, so um, now we go to another case study, which is very close to home. Uh, this was a, a case study that was used in developing a program that I worked on with, um, with Ishar some years ago. Um, so this particular case study is about a mother who migrated from Burma with a 17-year-old daughter. The daughter finished high school and trained at TAFE as a lab tech. She was um, very, very good. And all of a sudden, uh, once she did get a job at St. John of Court Hospital, somehow she quit the job and they couldn't understand what was going on. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia and she was referred to Isha. Uh, the mother was one of 11, 11 siblings. Um, she um, was very frightened by the diagnosis at the beginning because it, in, in her culture, you know, this was considered, she was considered a mad person. And uh, one of the good things, however, was that her, her nieces who had grown up in Australia were more accepting and they actually started influencing some of the extended family around the fact that, um, you know, uh, mental health issues were not necessarily uh, stigmatised and that uh, it's not being mad, it's just going through a specific part of life. Um, while the daughter was bright at school, uh, she also, once she was better understood and was able to get some support, uh, she gained skills that she needed to return to employment and she also got counselling at the Osborne Park Hospital and learnt how to drive. Uh, she became quite active uh, in uh, volunteering at the Salvation Army and attended the Catholic school. So now, in due course, she's been able to rebuild her life so that now as a daughter, she's the one who worries about her mother and her mother's well-being. So that's quite a big turnaround. And of course, uh, there are lessons to be learned from that. I think one of the big things that keep coming up everywhere is the crucial role of support groups, because it's one of the problems is when, when um, migrants and refugees are left um, isolated, it becomes very difficult to get change. So some of the support groups were around Isha, the social worker at the Osborne Park Hospital, the carers group, uh, the carers WA. These were all really important in helping the mother overcome some of the stigma and isolation she felt from her own cultural group. And she was able to rebuild her life in a different way. To understand schizophrenia, there was a workshop in um, the carers group that helped her better understand it. And she then got to the point where she was welcoming of people with mental health issues and felt it uh, important to convince others of that particular thing. So that's really um, the end of my presentation. Okay, so what we're going to go on to now, we're calling it more of a, a lived experience uh, sharing, but you picked up uh, particularly from Khadija, but also um, from Mary, their lived experience uh, sharing there as well. But we have Lul Ibrahim, who's going to talk to us uh, for a while. Uh, so Lul is a very active uh, community uh, leader and a founder of Somali Support Perth and a long-term advocate uh, for Somalis in Western Australia. She works with both uh, government and non-government policy uh, makings, uh, sorry, policy makers, and uh, she's the director of Mental Health Foundation Australia. So I'm going to welcome Lul to come over here <laughs> and like obey, obey, yeah, obey, yes, <laughs> obey <laughs> the uh, the purple stickies. Yes. And then um, after about 15 minutes or so with Lul, we'll see how she goes with talking. Everyone seems to be quite good at talking mm -hmm. today. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, a time, some question and answer and a bit of panel discussion involving uh, Khadija as well. Thank you. Hello, um, yeah, as you know, my name is Lou Ibrahim. I am going to divide into different categories, um, the upbringing, my upbringing, my education and mental health and family. <laughs> um, for me, first of all, I'm a mother, <laughs> so I can relate to that. And um, I'm a 
honored, you know, alhamdulillah, to have seven children, one boy and six girls. I love my son. <laughs> so I'll go to jail for him. <laughs> But anyway, I know how parenting is like. And when it comes to cow community, I am actually honored to stand here and talk about lived experience. I'm from, um, I arrived in New Zealand at a younger age. So I left Somalia at the age of three years old and went into a refugee camp from four years old to seven in Kenya Kakuma camp. And within that, you know, as a child, you learn everything through play and you, you build your resilient, you bring so much in it. If, you, if I compare myself to my kids, um, whatever that happens in um, refugee camps, where there is any types of torn war experience or whatever that goes through as a child, you're in a bubbly world and you come out as a resilient. You know, if you see a body in the next minute, you just wipe up and play as your friends and those around you. And for me, I think that has given me strength over the years. So anything that has happened or anything that actually happens, I'm like, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> it brings up, whereas my kids nowadays, they look at it as like, oh, I have a bad day. And I'm thinking, did you actually see a body? No. <laughs> so you did not have a bad day. <laughs> it brings you up. <laughs> so it's an honor. <laughs> it's a privilege. And not just only that, but growing up in New Zealand, I also had the privilege of experience both culture. And when I talk about both culture, I mean, my father was a single father and I was raised from the Somali and my neighbor, she was blonde hair, blue eyes, beautiful woman that I adore, that I loved. Her name was um, Jane, Jane, Janine. And the thing I loved about her is that she had three children and me, my brothers, and my sisters, and myself, she would raise us both. She didn't care the background. She would actually, homework needs to be done. You guys need to clean the room. Food must be eaten. And she would treat us as a children, as eight-year-old, as her own. And she stepped out as a mother's figure to all of us. And that's coming from, I mean, a father figure that I love my father. But for me, having that culture upbringing, and having the ability to understand, okay, both sides of made me who I am today. And when someone looks at me, they'll be like, oh, you're not Somali, <laughs> you're not white, you're not this, but I love it. I love it. It actually brings a uniqueness and perspective and part of who I am, part of who my identity is. And growing up that, I realized that um, that's one of my strengths. Even with, I didn't celebrate birthdays as a religion purpose but she would buy a present for her daughter and myself, and she would be like, Lose also my daughter. And that is where I grew up. And at the age of 16, I came to Australia. I missed that. I fell into a dark mode, because I had to come back to my identity as a Somali, go to school, education, come home. So I didn't know exactly what happened to me was type of a trauma, type of, okay, who am I meant to be? and who am I meant to stand up. Until now, the, it took a while for me to be unique, to say that I am me, and this is part of me. At the age of 16, I did my schooling here at um, Islamic College, and then at the age of 17, I moved, I got married, moved to Sydney, got pregnant, and I do understand that once again as a motherhood, but it was so difficult and challenging being pregnant and still doing school. I would hide. <laughs> Um, at, at school and then with my morning sickness and go to the bathroom, vomit, come back. But what made it more challenging is that my own people, you know, I had to, they had a different way of looking female. They had a different way of, you're married, you know, you cannot be around with the same age girls. Go to your husband. And it made me feel isolated. It made me feel, oh, I can't be with my friends. What did I do wrong? <laughs> Because I had to, to face the reality of being a motherhood, being that perfect home, husband, and I ended up becoming, having like a prostrate depression at that time. I wanted to the point that I, even if I go outside, people like parents will judge based on the way I raise my children. It's too cold, you're underdressed, you're overdressed. And then it made me think, okay, I am a bad person. And this is what happens to most of the teenage parenting. And I'm wondering how many of you actually went through or lived experience as a teenage, uh, teenage parent? Are there any? 
So it is challenging when you know you are experienced that you haven't developed you know emotionally or uh, physical the type of you know to compare to a thirty year old person, and this was for me to learn that journey to you know as I go through I had to be resilient and just be close to my child more than anything that's around him because sometimes what happens is we all have different ways of teaching people and we all have different expectations and we want to shove every detail and that's what we do as a parent we tell them that okay do this don't do this walk this don't walk this but then we don't realize let them make the mistake let them learn let them fail let them get up ask them okay how did you go how did, what was it you know what did you learn from it but we are so protective I was always been protected by my community. I've always been protected by those who around me wherever I go. But I needed that to let me out of my shell. Let me make my mistake. Let me learn my mistake. Let me be who I am. I cannot be the same as everyone. I was born to be different. And that's who I am right now standing teaching that there's no right or wrong way to be a parent. I've got a 17-year-old daughter, for God's sake. <laughs> she drives me. She drives me. <laughs> she is the mother of the house. I am the daughter. <laughs> and that's what I love about it. We become so same age, same way we think of. And she's like, Mom, where are you going? What community do you have? Shush. <laughs> Are you doing volunteering? You're not getting paid? <laughs> Go back to your education. Go back to... And I'm like, no, I meant to be saying all that. <laughs> and this is why, you know, it's important sometimes to let them as well, make friends with them, and then realize that they just like us. They're very clever and smarter than us. <laughs> and that is just um, how I brought up um, in terms of education. Um, like I've said before, when it comes to education, I was pregnant, having my morning sickness. But one thing um, it gave me a resilience is every year I get pregnant, I go back to education. <laughs> I get pregnant, I go back. I did nurse assistant with my, my first child, completed school, and then did nurse assistant. Pregnant, did another course. Pregnant, did another course. The last one I did was men. Medical administration, <laughs> number seven. <laughs> I'm waiting for number eight education. <laughs> what could that be? <laughs> Just never give up. You know, what we, what we forget as human is that we could be mothers, and this is why I decade most of mothers. You can be mothers, you can have children, but then at least do something for yourself. Your husband can die. Something can happen to your husband. He can divorce you. Your children can grow up. But what could you do as a parent? We're so focused on changing the children, but we forgot our, ourselves. We forgot our needs, our desires, who we're meant to be. And this is as a, like as a parent, so much things, packages that we carry, but sometimes we have to let her go. Let her go. Who are we trying to please? Who are we trying to impress? You know, so what if another parent's kids' are expectations get an A mark? So at the end of the day, they're going to end up going to the same college. They're going to end up going to the same university. They're going to end up going to the same work. It's about letting go of those expectations. And then we actually build those with the, the younger generations. And now the, when I realize the gaps between the older generation, my generation, and then the younger generation, the younger generation are spoon fed. We're spoon feeding them. They don't even know the right and the wrong. They don't know, you know, what to do, what not to do. They're just doing whatever they feel like. They're just in their own journey. As a parent, to be honest, in talking, I might be wrong, but as a parent, sometimes that what we have is a blessing. Whether we have one child, whether we have 10 children, it's a blessing from God. It's about bringing them up, raising them, and looking after them. I'm sometimes like, I went through, and in terms of if I come back to the Mental Health Foundation, the director of the Mental Health Foundation, I went through severe, you know, severe persistent depression, epileptic, whatever, suicidal, where my friends were going through the same challenges I was going through. My best friend died of suicidal. I tried three times, failed. I don't know why. <laughs> but I'm glad I'm still awake. 
in a culture that doesn't accept mental health. And I am the face of mental health. I do workshops to help mothers, um, workshops to help mental health parents awareness. Even if within my community, we have uh, mothers, um, mental, if any mother has a child, at least two weeks of food roasting to at least have mental health awareness for the community. Education is the key. And live experience people, they have that resilient. They have that power to share and to let you know. And thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much.